Hi, good afternoon. So, uh, like Patty said, my name is Casey Cook. I'm the emergency manager for the Matsu Borough. Um, I thought we were going to wait for um, everybody else to get here, but I'll try to speed this along until they get here. So, right now, um, as of our last update, the fire is currently about 6,500 acres. Um, the perimeter of that fire is about 18 miles. Um, and so, within that, there's some unburned spots, some houses and properties, um, but around a total of 6,500 acres. Uh, we had um, about 200 um, responders last night and yesterday fighting the fire. Um, we had about 95 Matsu Borough, City of Palmer, and City of Houston firefighters um, up there starting about 1.30 yesterday afternoon uh, till about 9 o'clock uh, this morning. Uh, we pulled in a task force from Anchorage and Chugiak fire departments as well to assist, get us through the night. We've got a couple hotshot crews that came up with Division of Forestry to uh, to be out doing structure protection and putting out the fire uh, and walking the flank lines and, and putting the fire out on those locations. Um, we had one firefighter that was treated or transported and treated to Matsu Regional Hospital for heat exhaustion symptoms. He was evaluated and released um, with no further complications. Um, right now, our incident command post is still set up at Willow Fire Station 12-1. Our incident commander uh, right now, today, is Malin Green, um, who is in a unified command structure with Division of Forestry. We've requested, or through that unified command, we've requested a Type 2 incident management team, which uh, Tom Kurth will be able to talk about when he gets here, um, and how that works and how the borough works in conjunction with um, that incident management to put out the fire, and uh, the borough handles borough business um, with evacuations and supplies and um, support of resources. So that's uh, kind of all I've got. Um, so I'm open to questions um, from anybody. And so we'll just go around and raise your hand or let me know and I'll notice you. Uh, are the hot shot crews on the ground now? There are several hot shot crews on the ground now and there are several more being flown in. Um, that'd be another one, good one for Tom Kurth. He'd be able to tell you exactly where they are and who they are. Casey, we heard something about um, several thousand pounds of explosives at a couple of gravel pits. Can you tell us anything about that? All right, so we have two um, uh, explosive depots uh, up in those areas, about mile 77 and 68, you know, thereabouts. Um, Austin Powder uh, owns at least one of them. Um, those are, are pretty well defended. Um, they were going up this morning at about 7 to assess and mitigate anything if they needed to to pull those um, explosives out of there or if they were going to be able to protect those in place um, and so from what I've heard that they they've left them there because um, they feel confident that they're going to be able to protect that and not have an explosion. Um, Casey, do you have an update on the number of structures that have been destroyed at all? <coughs> So I don't have a, a confirmed number. And so what we're waiting for right now is the fire uh, behavior to die down so that we can put our assessor crew in and our uh, damage assessment crew in to go in um, and, and enter those and do some damage assessments. Uh, so once we get, once the fire behavior dies down, we'll be able to go in and get an actual number. And then as we release that information to the public and be able to allow people to come back into their neighborhoods and their roads, um, we're setting that up through the EOC so that we don't have mass um, type of folks coming to, to look at houses that have been burned. So w we know that we have lost homes, um, but we're not ready to let you know because we don't know exactly how many there are. Go, go ahead, Nick. Yeah, that hurts a lot, especially. Can you just say, like, at a general level, like, what you guys are worried about today and sort of at a general level, how <coughs> sort of what the, what the biggest concern is for you guys? Sure. So today's uh, fire weather is predicted to be hotter, drier, and windier than it was yesterday. So that's our major concern, is now we're fighting a, a large fire with poor fire behavior conditions. The location of the fire is also very concerning because now it's into Willow proper, and so we've got multiple residents, multiple businesses, uh, infrastructure as well. If the wind picks up and starts kicking and, and, and doing those types of things and running and making runs into those those areas. So yesterday we had, you know, it's relatively a smaller population and a smaller building footprint. 
And now as we get closer into Willow proper and closer into Nancy Lake where there's more homes and more people, so you have more structures. Um, and so if it hits that and it start running, we're already pretty depleted on resources. Um, and so that's kind of the, the guessing game and, and the magic wand that we're trying to not have to wave and trying to stop it before it gets there. But a lot of it depends on the fire behavior and the weather and what we're going to. So they're doing uh, protective measures right now. They're doing some uh, dozer lines and some back burning to try to mitigate that from occurring and protect the sides. And then so they'll be able to attack the flanks and move in and get the front of the fire as well. They're hoping to do that before it gets super windy and super hot and more dry. And, and how worried are you guys about it ultimately sort of expanding to a, like a much broader area than you know, Willow proper? Is, is it sort of like that's the that's sort of what the way it looks right now, or, or is there a pretty significant concern that it could you know end up down in Houston or further than that? So my job is to do worst case scenario planning. So I, that's what I do, and so I look at all of that. So I look at moving shelters from one station to the next. Um, I look at bringing more people in, um, not only with Division of Forestry, um, you know, National Guard assets, other state assets, pulling in borough assets to be able to go in and move and, and municipality of Anchorage assets. And so we're looking at all those options to make sure that we have not only a plan B and a plan C, but then a plan D, you know, and so on down the line. So that that way, if, Hypothetically, it moves past Willow into Houston, you know, and further down. Um, we're going to know that well before it does, and so we're going to we're going to keep extending our evacuation range further and further as we need to, and so people should be aware that we're going to keep doing that um, until we feel that we have the fire under control and can call it contained. Um, do you know how many people have been evacuated, and are, are people cooperating at this point? Sure. Um, so yes, people are being very cooperative. I, I went to a, a, the shelter this morning in Houston and, and had about a half an hour conversation with the folks up there. Very, very cooperative, you know, very understanding of the stress that's being placed on, on the firefighters um, and the resources that we have. Um, <clears throat> we've got about 210 folks that were sheltered, not only, so about 160 in Talkeetna, um, folks that were driving south and weren't able to continue driving south and didn't want to turn around and drive all the way back to Fairbanks, so about 160 were put up there, and then the remainder were put up at the Houston Middle School uh, by the Red Cross, who did an excellent job um, sheltering those folks and making sure that they were safe and comfortable and, you know, had something to eat and something to drink and a, and a nice place to lay down and, and rest for the evening. I'm, I'm sorry if you said this earlier, so is it still at 6,500 acres from the last update? Yes. Okay, and then uh, containers are not really. So, so, yeah, so it's still at about 6,500 acres, so there wasn't a whole lot of forward movement. You know, they might have moved five or 10 feet here, you know, those types of things because of the fire behavior last night and the cool weather. Um, so we're still calling it at about 6,500 acres. It's not gonna be precise until we can get out and walk it. Um, right now, it's probably still zero contained because we're still fighting a very strong front of the fire. As far as I know, they've been arriving all night and they'll continue to arrive today. And how many? Once again, that'd be a Tom Kurth um, question who just walked in the door. So um, I can answer some more questions and we'll get Tom up here and those guys, but any more questions for, for me? Go ahead, Matt. Um, yeah, uh, what, um, what, what kind of uh, investigation has been done as far as the reports that the fire started? None. So priority right now, life safety, you know, property con conservation, and then we deal with everything else after that. So once lives are saved, once the fire's out, then we'll go back to look to see what caused it. Right now, that's not a big, our major concern. So, go ahead. One more. Uh, can you say, I mean, how did the, does it seem like the conditions in the, uh, like, low snow, how's that seem to be affecting what's happening now? So we had a dry winter. We had a dry spring. <laughs> it takes a lot of moisture to get, uh, you know, a, 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 a lot of rain to get a wetting rain. And we haven't had a lot of that either. And so that combined with the fuel sources, which is all black spruce, um, you know, dry duff, dry ground, 
Um, the fire is moving fast, it's moving very hot, it's just ripping through the patches of black spruce, um, you know, probably 20 or 30 miles an hour. Um, Assemblyman Halter might be able to make some comments on that. He did a tour yesterday, but um, it, it's, it's definitely weather driven and fire behavior driven at this time. So. Anything else? A lot of residents in the borough want to know how they can help. Can they help people in the shelters? Or, uh, you know, what can the average person do? Yeah, so a donation center has been set up or a donation collection point has been set up at my house. Um, and I think the Red Cross might be helping with that as well. Connie? And the borough's gonna the borough's gonna echo that we're not accepting donations um, because then we we would have to deal with the donations after that. So what we'll do is we'll work with um, um, Mr. Perth wherever he went, um, and and we'll look at setting up a, a disaster fund um, like they do at the state level. So we'll work with the state with them as well. And so if people want to donate, so usually the best thing for those donations is money to be able to get people back on their feet and buy the things that they need instead of getting you know, 10,000 Q-tips um, donated, and now what do we do with 10,000 Q-tips? So once we get that up, we'll get that out to folks and be able to put that out to the media to let them know how to donate. Is there one in the back there, Stefan? Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I had a question about a family that was up in Hatcher Pass um, and the possibility that they might be evacuated over the top. Um, Pearl officials have repeatedly said Hatcher Pass is not open at this time. Um, I've heard some radio traffic that says that it's open to large four-wheelers. Can you guys clarify what's the status there? Can anybody get out that way? I don't know what the current situation of Hatcher Pass is, but you don't really need to be going over Hatcher Pass right now. The road is still open. For folks leaving Willow Fishhook, they can go down to the parks, take a left, and drive into Wasilla, um, or you know, down this way into Palmer. They don't need to go over the pass. Troopers will let them go leave Willow Fishhook Road on the parks. Anything else for me? Okay, I think, uh, Patty. Yep, where's Tom? So next up we're gonna have Tom Kurth with Division of Forestry. See. Oh, maybe. Tom's not here? Or we're gonna bump him okay. our, uh, to lower. I wanted to acknowledge our borough mayor, Larry DeVilbus, is uh, right over there. Um, so we're going to have um, Manager John Moosey. Um, good afternoon. Um, this morning um, I signed a uh, disaster declaration um, for request for assistance for state assistance and I'd like to read that um, this afternoon. Whereas commencing on June 14, 2015, a Matt Nuskus who sit in a borough sustained severe threats to life and property loss from a wildfire in the Willow area. And whereas the Manuscripts to sit in a borough is a political subdivision within the state of Alaska. And whereas the following additional conditions exist as a result of this disaster emergency. Disruption of interstate transportation and tourism. Electrical power interruption for prolonged periods. Property loss and damage. Environmental impacts due to wildfire. And whereas the severity and magnitude of the wildfire emergency is beyond a timely and effective response capability of the local resources in the Matt News who sit in the borough has expended approximately $48,000 during the first operational period. Therefore, be resolved that the borough manager of the Matt News who sit in the borough does declare disaster emergency per Alaska statute 26.23.140 to exist in the Matt News who sit in the borough effective June 14th, 2015 at 12 noon. Furthermore, is requested the governor declare a disaster emergency to exist as described in Alaska statute 26.23.020 and provide state assistance to the Matanuskus who sit in a borough in the form of public assistance, individual assistance, and other emergency resources to help the borough in its response and recovery from this event. Further, the undersigned certifies that the Matanuskus who sit in a borough has expended its local resources as a result of this disaster emergency. I'm signed by myself. Um, we have um, had an earlier meeting um, this morning uh, with the governor. He is here. Um, I am very pleased with the response 
um, of the state office, um, Alaska Forestry, um, the resources the borough has thrown at it, and our partnerships that we have with the city of Wasilla um, and our school district and other local community um, partners um, who are affecting um, positive outcomes in this disaster. Um, I'll have any questions that you may have. Yes. Uh, 48, um, the $48,000 um, is really going to, at this point in time, um, supplies and um, resource rentals, that sort of thing. Um, this was occurred prior to midnight um, last evening. Uh, money is, is kind of rolling in. Uh, we do have some authority to, um, uh, to expand before we have to go back to this, uh, the assembly to get further approval. Um, but this is uh, a requirement. Um, of the emergency declaration that we are spending borough resources. So that was from like 115, what was first called in until midnight? Yes. Yes. Okay, thank you. So we're awaiting Tom Kurth, but we're gonna have assembly member Vern Halter who was on the scene last night. Hello everybody, I'm Vern Halter from Willow and uh, I guess I'll just say it's very somber up in Willow right now. It's a very serious fire, and I, I haven't had much sleep, so you'll have to kind of have a little patience with me. Uh, the fire started up at Sockeye Road above Cash Whitney Lake about 1 o'clock yesterday. It uh, you know, went from a small fire up to an acre, up to 10 acres, up to 200 acres, up to 1,000 acres, uh, really rapidly. It crossed the Parks Highway at Capitol Speedway right there. Uh, and then it was on the east side of the Parks Highway, coming down along the Parks Highway. It made a crossing back over the Parks Highway about a mile to a mile and a half, two miles just north of Willow Creek. Uh, Casey Cook, who just spoke to you, I was in his uh, command truck. We drove through it when it was crossing. It was the most incredible thing I've ever seen. I actually got scared. And fire on both sides, the ditches are burning, the trees are burning. Uh, how is this? So, uh, I just want to thank the firefighters, uh, Matsu Burrow. You know, I could see trucks in these houses putting water on these houses, and uh, they saved a lot of them. I know of at least 12 to 15 houses that are lost. A lot of my friends, Dee Dee John Rowe and that whole neighborhood, I used to have a house there that's just leveled, really, tell you the truth. I think we moved four to 500 sled dogs in a matter of two, three hours, horses and other animals uh, south. Uh, I think Martin Boozer has 400 sled dogs there right now, and uh, it's, uh, you know, the, my worry right now, they're trying to, if it splits and goes east side of Willow plus west side of Willow, uh, you, you would have two different fires you're trying to fight at the same time. That would be a, that's a huge worry, so they're trying to, along the railroad line, which is coming down along the Parks Highway east side, they're trying to do a fire bulldoze, a fire line out there, stop it right there. I was at the community center, Willow Community Center, most of the afternoon and night, and I, I, I honestly thought for a while this, that that community center could burn last night. But fortunately, they made a stand there, you know, in the, rail, the airport's right on the right there, and uh, stopped it coming from down through there, and then it went west, and then down through Crystal Lakes a little bit, and that's kind of where it is right now. And uh, you, you know, the wind, it's, it's over 80 in Willow right now, 80 degrees. And the wind was picking up when I left two hours ago, uh, or starting to pick up. You could see the breeze starting to pick up in the trees. And uh, so it's a, it's a tough one to say that I really appreciate the governor flying up there. And he just, he'll probably tell you he saw it from the air just now. And, uh, you know, there's thousands of homes along those lakes right there on the east or the west side of the Parks Highway. And then right along the east side of the Parks Highway, that's where your heavy population is and concentration of homes. Uh, of course, Houston, you know, it has that, you know, the Miller's Reach fire, of course, started south of us a little ways in Willow, but it has that same south southerly direction it wants to kind of go. And uh, so it's a very worrisome thing at this point in time. And I guess the weather is not going to change. We had a weather briefing uh, uh, an hour ago. The weather doesn't want to change for two, three days. You know, hot and dry, and of course, the wind's going to pick up during the day 
and I, I, I'll bet the wind's concentrated more 2 to 6, 7 p.m., it seems like. And, uh, and of course, they've got tankers here down from Fairbanks, up from Kenai. There's tankers coming from British Columbia, is my understanding. Uh, and there's other fires in the state of Alaska, but this is, a, I, I, I believe, is the number one priority right now because of the concentration of the population in the borough. And, uh, you know, it's just, it, it's, uh, I was, I want to again thanks to all, thank all the firefighters and stuff for putting their lives on the line. I, uh, I just landed from flying over the fire. Uh, this morning I received this uh, request from the Declaration of Disaster from uh, Mr. Muzi on behalf of the um, Matsu Borough. I met with the, with the mayor this morning and we had a, a briefing before I went out to look at the, look at the fire. Uh, it, is, it is significant. I, what's really significant is a, a group of, of the effort on the firefighters to do what they can to protect the, uh, the structures that are there. We, it was amazing to see the number of, of homes that were there that you will know only were there because people risked their lives to fight for those homes as far as it's pretty powerful. Um, so the, I mean the, the, the fire itself is, is, um, um, is, is very powerful but the, the human response has been, has been I think equally powerful to me to, to fly over and see what, what's been burned and what's been left. Boy, we, <clears throat> we are so sorry about the, the losses of structures that have, that have taken place. Um, I'm very pleased there's been no loss of life. I know we've, we've lost some, some animals in the process and, and that's most unfortunate. Um, you know, the, the smoke jumpers jumped out just below us while we were flying over and that's, that's something to see as well. I mean, talk about putting your life on the line. They're actually jumping into, uh, into, the, into as close to the fires as uh, they say if they can. Um, so the response has been, been just huge. I've, my, my ask was, what have you asked for um, that you've not received? Because that's what I want to know about. How can, how can we help? And, and, and it's, been, it's been phenomenal. The response from around the state, um, there's, there's areas of, of the state where there are other fires going on up in the Toke area right now, so we can't bring every, everything here, but this, is a, this is, has significant potential. Um, I, I, there's a couple of ways I can respond to the request for declaration of disaster. One is to, to begin a process and sort of study it, and I, I'm not. I'm accepting it today. Um, it's, it's deserved. It's, um, it's, I'm sorry it's deserved because uh, it's deserved because of what you've done so far. This, this is, we will take immediate action. We will take the, we'll take, we'll use the step that's available to me to verbally say we accept this and, and make this a declaration of disaster. Um, it is, um, it is something that to behold to fly over that and see the, see the, uh, see, and what's again most impressive to me is what's left that didn't get burned. And that's only because, you know, people have, have responded and, and, and shown up in the middle of the night. My plane landed about one o'clock this morning and you could see the, uh, the glow from, uh, from that area, but to actually fly over it today and see it uh, up close was, was very, very Im impressive and, and, uh, and, and frightening as well. The source of fuel that's available to it is, is, is a concern. I don't begin to um, uh, talk to any, any specifics about the technical nature of it potentially splitting and going one direction or another direction. The river's on one side. Um, I'd say the road was open, uh, it was being convoyed through. Uh, my understanding is that the railroad is still uh, remains open. Um, so a tremendous, tremendous effort of outpouring in this, in this region to, and unfortunately this isn't the first time there's been a situation like that. So uh, it sounds to me like there's a whole lot of lessons learned from before and, and uh, I couldn't be more proud of our effort uh, as, a, as a state, the National Guard, what they're doing. Uh, we saw the, uh, the uh, location where they're, they're dipping water and, and picking them up in three or 4,000 gallon buckets and, and dropping them near the fire. So uh, everybody's doing what they're supposed to do. Um, there's a, a new cruiser coming in tonight and uh, there'll be a new, I think five new crews tomorrow is what I'm told. And so I'm happy to answer non-technical questions. Um, but I tell you, it's really quite something to, uh, to see the, the, uh, the agencies working together. I spent uh, some, some time, I got a briefing yesterday about every two hours. Um, I don't know when Dean Brown sleeps, but I, I, uh, my last one was at, at uh, 1.22 this morning and I got my next one at 6.02. So it's just, it's just nonstop around the, around the clock. So uh, much to be thankful for in, uh, thus far, um, but um, I think the, um, uh, you know, um, there's more, there's more help on the way. And so they'll be here tonight, they'll be on the scene tomorrow morning is what I'm told. Happy to answer any questions. That looking quite ca casual today. Sure, I can talk. Why are you out? 
is there anything that you know you think the state needs that it's sort of requested that it hasn't gotten at this point? <coughs> I think that uh, what my uh, my inquiry has been all morning. What have you asked for something that's that's not been available? And and uh, they've been very very um, pleased with the response from from every agency um, um, that they've they've asked me for. I know that uh, there's response uh, vehicles coming out from different parts of Alaska. Uh, some parts are need to stay. Um, we know the interior uh, up north is going to be you know is is it has some issues as well. So being a little bit careful about about that. But uh, there's been a an outpouring across the state, as far as I know. So. Very good. Thanks very much. So this is Tom Kurth. You'll be able to answer uh, questions about the Division of Forestry efforts. Okay, good afternoon. Thank you for the governor's response here. It's been very helpful in helping formulate a, an appropriate response here. My name is Tom Kurth. I'm the fire program manager for the Division of Forestry, but I'll be acting as the Type 1 incident commander for this particular incident. What that means is we're bringing in a team of managers who have specialties in things like operations, logistics, finance, safety, information, and those managers will all come together and we'll have an in-briefing here at 1600, at which point we'll go and help supplement the forces that are already on there. So the initial attack forces are out there. There's over 100 of them in various places uh, throughout this fire. Uh, they're somewhat in a defensive mode, protecting structures, evacuating areas, retreating, returning, coming back, and making sure that the uh, structures that are intact there stay protected. And then we'll start a more offensive mode when we get additional supplemental crews and aircraft in here, and they'll uh, start to put a line around that. We have a, a heavy equipment on the very north end of the fire where we'll anchor. So that's building a place where we feel safe to operate from. That's being done uh, all the way up there at the tip of the fire, so we like to anchor, flank, and pinch. We'll use natural barriers such as the river, the road, the railroad, that sort of thing to try and contain this fire as uh, we get an opportunity here. The weather forecast I think you've already had, it's not very favorable. We expect uh, hot, dry conditions. Our uh, remote weather stations are already showing very dry conditions out there. Once the relative humidity start to uh, drop down below the you know, like 30%, which they already have, and as they uh, drop even further, that's where the black spruce, the primary fuel type out there, begins very volatile, and then you get the, the wind coming up in the afternoon, that starts to push it. So our crews, particularly on the south end there, will be certainly challenged here as the afternoon progresses. I don't, I'm not sure you've been told, but we have five hotshots uh, crews coming in from the lower 48, in addition to the crews that are already out there and that takes a big jet to pick those folks up. They'll be uh, placed in uh, some of our critical areas as soon as they get on scene here. The Type 1 hotshot crews, why we bring in those, they're very independent. They can operate uh, with limited supervision and at a point where we are with a fire like this, that gives them uh, or at least gives us uh, a sense of security that they can go out there and do their job uh, safely out there. So. There's uh, people positioned on the south end of the fire, uh, or correction, on the north end of the fire, and then on uh, some on the west end of the fire, where I think it's Crystal Road is, uh, to do some structure protection. They're also on the, uh, the east side of the fire, along the railroad area there, to try and capture some of those spots that there are. If you've seen how a fire progresses in a windy situation, it tends to develop its own weather in front of the fire and then it starts throwing spots and those are, you know, 100 feet out there, 200 feet out there, they can start to get out there a quarter mile and that fire that was moving yesterday has laid a bunch of those spots out there so we have to try and contain those first, develop a good line, a place where we can take advantage of the terrain and the fuel type there and get, uh, get that fire corralled uh, as soon as possible. So that's where we stand right now. Uh, I'm not sure if you have uh, specific questions, but we'll uh, be more than happy to uh, answer those. We're going to put an incident command post in the Houston area, I believe at the Houston School. 
Uh, that gives us a little bit of buffer there because the willow area was actually threatened last night. It's very intimidating when that wind starts blowing and that column leans over and a lot of what's out there starts to become obscured by that heavy smoke. And so it looks like that fire is progressing uh, sometimes more rapidly than it actually is, but it certainly is intimidating when those things are happening out there. So uh, that's what we look like uh, right now. And uh, we, have, uh, we have a very good Air Force uh, that's uh, been supplemented here. I think you saw three Blackhawks out there. We have one scooper and uh, I think at least three retardant ships uh, will be supplementing those from Canadian resources here uh, today. So we'll get another Convair group up here. And those, uh, you know, that, uh, there's, uh, there's a point when uh, we can get that retardant down, but if it starts blowing too hard, then even our aircraft are uh, handicapped some. But we'll, we'll have uh, plenty, of, uh, plenty of aircraft and crews to get started on this operation. And we do have the advantage, it looks like it's running into that, I think it's Nancy Lake area, and so we'll have some advantage there. Off on the east side, it's got some swampland in there. We've got smoke jumpers that have landed in there. They'll be bringing a boat with them, and uh, they'll be in the Willow Creek area uh, looking at structures and protecting structures there. So any questions from you folks? Yeah. Well, certainly this area is familiar with the Miller's Reach fire. That was the greatest loss of structures that we have had uh, for the Division of Forestry. And that was 19, Casey, what is it? 96. And so uh, certainly similar conditions, you know, hot, dry, windy. You know, that wind is really our primary enemy out there because that, uh, uh, that supplies those fires with plenty of oxygen and you know any fire is a fuels weather topography sort of thing and when it starts blowing out there uh, that's where the problem starts because it can if you're on a front line of that in, in a uh, you know an initial tack at the head of the fire that's where it can go over your head and spot beyond you there but uh, certainly Miller's Reach is our best example of that but you know uh, a loss of structures is um, that's that's occurring um, with some regularity, but not generally in, in large numbers. So we're fortunate there. It's just typically the Alaskan landscape is dotted with these individual homes out there. So, you know, having defensible space around those areas so that a firefighter can go in there and defend those areas is critical at times like that. And it means open space and no ladder fuels to take the fire up into the trees and that sort of thing. So those, those homes sometimes will survive when a fire passes through there. You know, it, uh, it, sometimes that fire is going so fast it'll just uh, go right by them and the danger becomes, you know, any lingering fire that's left to smolder in there and that's what we'll be looking for when we kind of do this retreat return sort of, uh, uh, that, that'll be a strategy to, uh, that we're doing right now. You know, our number one focus is certainly protecting lives out there and making sure the places are evacuated. And then structures after that, you know, we, we don't want to downplay the structures thing, but that can, those structures can be replaced. So, so that is the good news. Whereas human life, that's, that's a, has a finality to it. So uh, we're, we're to the point, uh, we think we have the evacuation uh, taken care of and now uh, protecting structures is where we're at. Yes? Well, uh, we have various levels of complexity from a one through five, and the, the most complex fires are our type one. And in Alaska, we have two type two teams, and uh, we're on a rotational basis. And a typical fire is oftentimes in Alaska is a type two fire, just from the standpoint, it's usually logistics that we're dealing with, geography supplies and that sort of thing. And then when you get more complicated with your urban interface, structures, road corridors, you know, these transportation corridors, once you start closing those down, uh, that affects the tourism industry, a train's trying to get to a bus, who's trying to get to a plane, there's contractors moving through. So we raise the complexity level up. And what we do with the Alaskan teams is we take both teams and combine them to take uh, our type two, incident command teams and turn it into a type one. We're all qualified at both levels. 
And so, you know, we're oftentimes on a national rotation, so we are capable of fighting fire in the lower 48 too. But, you know, it's nice to have the Alaskan experience because people know the geography, they know the fuel type, they know who they're working with, and so, um, you know, we, we are moving to the type one level to, to combine and get our best experienced firefighters. And then, uh, Casey spoke to this a little bit earlier, but just to get a little bit of elaboration on, I mean, you know, how much, like, how far are you guys worried about the fire moving to, I mean, can you give us some sense of, you know, what's the area that's immediate risk and what's the area that's, you know, risk in the next couple of days or the next week? Sure, and I think, uh, let's see, we're on day two here, right? So you got an idea of what this fire can move in one day. That's, uh, you know, that's something like seven mile. That's, that's how, oftentimes, you know, it'll push down with that wind. So out it goes to seven miles. Then you get a different wind direction. Off it goes out to the east to the west or starts pull, pushing or pulling on, you know, various hot spots. And so there, there's plenty of potential out there. Now, we're looking for some place, you know, like I said, we're getting an anchor point at the tail, but we're also looking at areas where we might be able to take advantage of natural barriers. Again, it's a fuels weather topography thing. So we're in flat land in a lot of that area, but a lot of that fuel is continuous. Any place you have that continuous black spruce, you know, that's a very fire prone species. Gasoline on a stick for, you know, if you want for more spectacular language, but that stuff is carried you know, it, it'll carry a fire and it'll move, and uh, as I was talking about spotting, so here it goes, you know, here it goes spotting ahead of you, and those spots combine, they get pulled back into the fire, get pulled back, and out they go and get pulled back. So that's how those fires grow in rapid succession. Now, the burn period here, that's something Alaska is very unique for. You know, that's, that's at what point these fires become active, and now because we have these long days, right, It'll burn well into, you know, in the lower 48, some of those fires might calm down at 10 o'clock. We'll burn into 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 1, 2, something like that. So the longer burn periods allow those fires to grow during that, uh, you know, that long day there. So I think this fire uh, was uh, started around 1 o'clock. And when you see something like that, when it starts to get active early in the day, early in that burn period, those are the problematic fires for us like that, and just because they have lots of time to grow. Yes, a hotshot crew is a 20 person crew, so that's, that represents a hundred people, which we're able to get on a jet to, to bring up here. Again, they're our most experienced firefighters. With them comes supervision so they can operate independently. They also bring Sawyers with them so that, uh, you know, that's how we establish saw line with, the, they might have as many as six Sawyers with them and, and saws so they, they can, they're used to working around timber, large timber and that sort of thing. And then uh, they also can do uh, what you know as burning out. So they're capable of doing that independently. So they may see, you know, if, if the fire looks like this, like it's poked in like this, and so they're gonna tie this together, this together, this together, and this together to give us a straight line. And then they'll burn that section out in there to secure that so that they take that, all that fuel out of there. And that gives them a good solid line. We like to say it's not a good line until it's a black line, which means we have taken that capability of that fire to advance on there by removing the fuel. Now, one of the disadvantages or why this country is so fire resistant is because this duff layer, you know, if you're in the lower 48 again, you scratch a line and out comes the dirt. Here, it's maybe two feet of duff there before you get to a mineral surface. So you, you, it's best done with heavy equipment because then you can get right down to that mineral base down there, which doesn't allow the fire to creep so we, our fastest line is built by a saw line, tying it together and then burning out those edges there to make it a nice even line. So we don't have to tear that duff apart and go down to that mineral surface. Sometimes you find permafrost out there too and that gets real soggy and wet on you, so. And I'm sorry this has already been said, but is this the number one priority fire in the country right now? Well, it's the number one priority fire in Alaska, however, 
Our fire season differs a little bit from down there in the lower 48. Again, we are, our, our busiest month is actually May, but our biggest month is, is in June, so that's when we have the biggest acres. And we are fortunate that we can pull up supplemental workforce from the lower 48 because their fire season has not engaged yet, which is usually, it can, it'll get earlier and earlier here, but end of June, July, most likely August or something like that. So we call the Canadians and say, hey, we need a tanker group up here. And they say, okay, we'll get you one today, something like that. We'll get you five hotshot crews. We'll get you this, we'll get you that. So we're very fortunate to have that capability to us. So we become the, the number one priority. We'll also uh, be looking at a, a so-called FEMA declaration. You'll be hearing about that, but that's a, that is a declaration that helps uh, pay for uh, state resources done by the federal government. So if we have a certain threshold of values at risk out there, which will certainly pass in this, then they will help supplement the firefighting effort with income there. And don't confuse it with uh, FEMA recovery, you know, for home replacement or something like that, because you'll hear the word FEMA tossed out there, but it's really, they are supplementing our firefighting costs with a uh, fire management um, uh, agreement and grant like that. We have to get approval for that, so that's what we're in the process of doing right now. Okay, well, we'll uh, put together some uh, public meetings, uh, most likely up uh, further north. Uh, we'll determine where the need is, but uh, part of our responsibility is keeping you, the public, informed uh, and telling you where this fire is, what it's doing, where it's moving, that sort of thing, so that you can make informed decisions out there. So we'll uh, try and do that uh, up in the uh, Willow and uh, Houston area to, uh, to let folks know uh, exactly what's going on. So, and then we have uh, plenty of uh, information that we're placing on websites. You can see a map, we're on Facebook, we're uh, on uh, akfireinformation.com, um, is it, I guess? And so those are places where you can go and see how this fire is progressing. And, and trying to keep uh, ahead of the information game here is one of the things that we're, we're trying very hard to do so that uh, you folks, it, it takes the pressure off our dispatches if we can get that information out to you. So we'll be doing the best we can to keep that uh, information flow going to you guys. Mm -hmm. and do you know when that first public meeting will be or is that still in the works? Well, we're being in brief today and the sooner the better. So, you know, I, I'll look maybe for even tomorrow night if we, if we can do that. So. You know, uh, the, the sooner we well, better because uh, everybody, uh, nobody likes dealing with the unknown out there. So we'll, we'll do the best we can there. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Oops, you got your map. There's uh, about 25 copies of the disaster declaration at the back uh, for reporters. We're going to post it online for other folks if that's okay. And uh, the borough website, as well as the Facebook page, has been continuously updating and will continue to. We do have a call center also. Uh, it's on your sheet out there with numbers, uh, manning and helping uh, in the EOC. On donations, we're going to work more on that and get more information out to the public on where you can drop in and, and how to do so. All right, thank you. Thank you.